My husband, Charles, tells me he's going to marry the woman he's been seeing and asks for a divorce. Let's not waste time with property division. Just leave quickly. Sharon taunts me as if she's relishing in my misery. Donald, too, is infatuated with a woman he met at a bar. They don't want to live with me. I'll leave, just as you wish. But before that, I'll give you a piece of my mind. My name is Joy Lynn. Named with the hope of being blessed with much joy, joy in Joy Lynn. I'm a 50-year-old woman whose life hasn't been as joyful as I'd hoped. But now my days are filled with happiness, so I can look back and laugh at the past. Let me take you back to when I was 35. I was about to celebrate my 10th wedding anniversary with Charles. We hadn't been blessed with children, and I found it somewhat painful to hear comments from those around us like, Do you have any kids? And, Children are wonderful, you know. Conversations with Charles had dwindled, partly because he had been promoted a few years earlier, became busier with work, and traveled frequently. I was working too, so we hardly saw each other. No wonder we didn't have children. Well, this too is a form of marriage, and it's easier on our minds. Having children or not, it doesn't matter. That's what I thought. One day, our family grew in a way we hadn't expected. It wasn't an angelic baby that arrived. Instead, it was parents-in-law that seemed like demons from hell. Apparently, right after we got married... The parents-in-law had been constantly telling Charles that they wanted to live with us. Charles weighed the hassle of living together against the hassle of continually refusing. As a result, he decided that living together would be less of a hassle. Surprisingly rational, or not. Hey, I didn't agree to live together. According to Charles. I'm hardly ever home, so it's fine. It might be fine for you. But still, as Charles said, it's fine if the parents-in-law are good people. I had a hard time with these parents-in-law, even before we started living together. They were the ones who persistently asked me, When are you having kids? Sharon would always say, The more children you have, the better, every time we met. But you only gave birth to Charles, right? Living with such parents-in-law? It's a stomach-churning story. I wonder how living together will turn out. My expectations were quickly betrayed, not in a good way. It turned out even worse than I thought. Donald solemnly declared as we started living together, We won't give you any pension or living expenses. Then Sharon continued with a smile. Let's go with that arrangement. Wait, what kind of arrangement is that? Charles also said something like, we both work, so we can manage without receiving living expenses. So Charles is one of them, too. I had never been particularly dissatisfied with Charles until now. I didn't expect much from a husband, even before we got married. I thought a husband who doesn't get angry easily and works hard was good enough. But now, a wave of complaints that I never had before came rushing in. Moreover, as I lived with the parents-in-law for a while... I gradually understood the reason they wanted to live with us. Donald would often go out somewhere at night. I believed him when he said he was going out to drink with friends. But then, I found a point card from what you'd call a nightclub and a business card with Nancy written on it in the laundry. There are various types of bars, but this was clearly a service industry that directly satisfies a man's desires. I see, he likes Nancy. I can't believe he's still so energetic at his age, I thought. Of course, I meant it in a bad way. No wonder he can't give us living expenses. He's spending it on Nancy. It can't be helped. No way. On the other hand, Sharon gradually started to harass me. Moreover, she was cunning and intensified the harassment gradually. So much so that even I didn't notice at first. At first, I thought she was being kind. I could have endured it if it had just been about the way I fold laundry or season my cooking, but there were times when Sharon called me by the name of Charles's ex-girlfriend. Every time Sharon would apologize, saying, I remember her strongly because she was the first girlfriend Charles introduced me to. I didn't do it on purpose. I'm sorry. 
At first, I thought, Sharon is old, so maybe such things happen. But as it continued, I realized something was off. Speaking of which, every time I took a shower, the bathroom was always dirty. I initially thought the mess in the bathroom was from Charles and the others who had gone in before, but no one complained about the bathroom being dirty, so without a doubt, it must have been Sharon who was in before me. There were other instances, too, like when Sharon mistakenly, thinking everyone had already bathed on a snowy day, unplugged the bathtub, leaving me to shower in the freezing cold. She also once took my favorite necklace from the closet without asking and then lost it. Each time, Sharon would say, I didn't do it on purpose. I just wasn't thinking. I'm sorry. While it's possible to accidentally shower or call someone by the wrong name, taking jewelry without permission is not something that can be brushed off as a mere oversight. I began to suspect that maybe this was all intentional harassment aimed at me. When I saw Sharon angrily sitting at the dining table saying, My dinner is late because Joy Lynn came home late, I finally realized it was indeed harassment albeit subtle. Come to think of it, Sharon hasn't done any housework since she came to our home. She throws her socks inside out into the laundry and tosses bottles into the trash without removing the labels, adding minor inconveniences every time. She complains if meals are late and if the sheets are messy, and sometimes she even throws things. I finally understood. Our home was indeed graced by the arrival of a baby, Two of them, in fact, both big and delightfully stubborn. Exhausted from my job as a caregiver, all I wanted was to quickly escape this situation and go to bed, so I kept silently tolerating Sharon's behavior. I didn't have the energy to argue with anyone when I returned home. I wanted to rest as quickly as possible, even if it was just for a moment. While I was exhausted and didn't notice at first, it seemed that Sharon knew about Donald's night outings. When an actress appeared on TV, Sharon persistently asked Donald, Donald, don't you like girls like her? You do, don't you? The actress's name was Nancy, the same as the girl from the bar. Donald looked pale. After that incident, I asked Sharon once, Are you okay with Donald going out like that? Sharon replied, If I get a divorce, I'll be someone who has a divorce history at this age, right? That's miserable, and it looks bad to society. Of course I don't like it. But he's just playing with professionals at the bar, right? If he's not serious, I can accept it. She wasn't holding back from divorce because of her concern for Donald, but rather she feared becoming someone with a history of divorce. I couldn't understand it. Turning a blind eye to infidelity must be causing her significant internal stress. And Sharon's outlet for that stress was harassing me. By harassing me, not only could she vent her stress, but she could also avoid doing housework. It was like killing two birds with one stone. I was certain. I knew why Sharon had insisted on living with Charles. Since living with the in-laws, Charles increasingly made excuses not to come home, saying he had to work overtime. This house was rotten from the roots to the pillars. At this rate, even I might end up crushed under the rotten floorboards. It happened one day, about six months after we started living together. Charles, who rarely had the same day off, said something unexpected. Please, let's get a divorce. It was a bolt from the blue. It turns out, Charles had been having an affair with a classmate for a long time. He even said he wanted to marry this person. And I had no clue. Apparently, they started dating just before he got promoted. I thought he was working hard for our sake, but could it have been for his classmate? Was it my fault for not paying attention to Charles' behavior, using my exhaustion as an excuse? I thought affairs only happened on TV, and to people like Donald. No, maybe it's natural for Charles to cheat, given that Donald does it too. Once this house is ready, my girlfriend and I are moving in. You can take your things and leave, Charles declared. Sharon asked, What's going to happen to us? You can stay. My girlfriend doesn't mind sharing, Charles responded. What a nice girl. Joy Lynn, don't let her get away with it if she asks for property division. We're going to use this house and everything in it. Donald chimed in. Yeah, she's a really good girl. 
especially if she's cuter than Joy Lynn. Sharon shot Donald a look as if to say, There you go again with women. But Charles and Donald just laughed. <laughs> These people are hopeless, I replied. All right, I'm fine with the divorce. There's a memorial ceremony in Atlanta soon, right? Can you wait until then? Planning on enjoying the feast at the memorial ceremony? Are you? How pathetic. There's no way I'm taking a woman who's divorcing me. Just leave already. Who's the pathetic one here? Who cares about the food? Despite everything, Sharon and I, the only women in the room and both cheated on, can't seem to get along. No, I was planning to move out on that day. Going back home is a bit embarrassing since I was cheated on. Finding a place and handling the paperwork takes time. I thought it would work out around then. Charles, not Sharon, replied condescendingly. If that's the case, fine. Cheating and then acting all high and mighty? Don't underestimate me. I'll destroy everything. A week passed, and the long-awaited day of revenge finally arrived. That day, my parents-in-law and Charles left the house early in the morning to attend a memorial ceremony in Atlanta. They planned to return by evening. All right, then. Let's give it a try. The garbage collection service I had hired arrived. I had them load all the furniture in the house into the truck. The sofa, the microwave, Charles and the parents-in-law's bed, and Sharon's clothes that had accumulated since moving in. Charles' favorite new vacuum cleaner, even the refrigerator and its contents. All of it gone. Ah, minimalism is wonderful. With each item thrown away, it felt like my troubles were disappearing. Next, the movers came to transport my important belongings to my new place. By evening, the house was empty. The front door made a sound. It seemed Charles and the others had returned. I decided to greet them one last time, as a good wife, and stood at the entrance with a smile. What? You're still here? Charles frowned openly. So did my parents-in-law. Oh, that's harsh. It's the last time, so it's fine to see each other's faces before leaving, right? I wanted to see your face. Huh? You still care about me. <laughs> Blushes slightly. He chuckles. What's the big deal? Fine. Let's have a meal together one last time, shall we? Charles, strangely in a good mood, heads towards the living room saying this, followed by Sharon, who looks exasperated, saying, Charles is so sweet. Donald, on the other hand, turns to me with a proud look, saying, That's my son. I'm baffled. Having a meal, huh? Would have been a nice way to part if there was anything left to eat. Huh? What? What? Ah! Uh! The meaning of my words, Charles, upon opening the living room door, lets out a silent exclamation. Sharon, annoyed, peeks into the living room after Charles and exclaims just like him, What? Ah! Oh! Donald does the same. What? Wait. Jo what? Why? The fridge. No, even the furniture. Appliances, too. Why is there nothing anywhere? Of course, I threw them out. The house feels much bigger now, doesn't it? I thought it would be bad to leave old furniture for your new life with your girlfriend. Consider it my parting gift. Threw them out. Why? Weren't you preparing to move? I've already moved. You throw away things you don't need when you move, right? Have you forgotten? Most of the things we bought when we got married were purchased with my money. Nothing bad will happen just because I, who didn't need them, threw them away. At my words, Charles points at me, his mouth moving, but no words coming out. He seems too shocked to speak. With this, I'll forego any division of property. Well, there's hardly anything to divide, anyway. Sharon, furious at my smile, says, What have you done? I'll return that phrase to your foolish son. There are limits to indecency, like cheating while having a wife and then saying to leave because you're remarrying. Wasn't your upbringing at fault? How could you speak to me like that? You were such a terrible daughter-in-law. Do you still consider yourself my mother-in-law? To me? You're just another old lady. 
I speak with a malicious smile, and Sharon mutters, So ungracious! Shaking with anger, it's a secret that seeing Sharon angry is starting to be a bit fun. Don't you remember? If I ask for division of this house, you can't refuse, can you? Without the house, where would you two strangers live? You sold your family home, right? Yes, the parents-in-law had sold their house when they moved in with us. We won't need it anymore, they had said. So this house was absolutely necessary for them. They sided with their son's affair over his wife, probably thinking, As long as there's a house with a housemaid, anything goes. Hearing my words, perhaps feeling rushed, Donald intervenes. Well, well, let's settle this amicably. Pretending to be a good person. Yes, let's do that. Let's proceed calmly, just like the old ma- I mean, just like Donald suggests. Exactly. You know what I'm talking about, Joy Lynn. Of course. By the way, Donald, wasn't your cell phone broken today? Huh. Oh, yeah. I realized it after leaving the house. It wouldn't turn on. If charging doesn't work, I guess I'll have to consult the store. There's no need for that. Your cell phone is right here. Saying that, I pulled Donald's cell phone from my pocket. Huh? Two identical phones? What's going on? Donald is puzzled. I switched the phones just before you left today. The one I have is the real one, and the one you had is a used one I bought and removed the battery, so it won't turn on. What? Since you aren't tech-savvy, I thought you'd just give up easily thinking it's broken or out of battery. It seems like a huge success. Smiling, I get asked by Donald. Why would you do that? Why, you wonder? Well, I have no clue. Speaking of which, you received an email today from your beloved Nancy saying she had a good time the other day. You email each other daily, right? I'm so jealous of your close friendship. What? Donald gasps while Sharon glares at him. So, Donald... You were out with Nancy the other day. Woohoo! More lovey duffy than with Sharon. But you should put a lock on your phone if you're cheating. You'll get caught easily. St stop it! Joy Lynn, th this. But I thought cheating is wrong. Charles cheated on me, and it hurt. I know exactly how Sharon feels. So I did something nice at the end. I texted Nancy. I'm bored. Let's break up. She was furious. I was dealing with this old man because he conveniently gives me money. Good thing you broke up safely. Oh, by the way, this is Nancy. Sharon, your enemy, take a good look. Saying that, I showed everyone a photo of Nancy and Donald as I returned the phone. That's when it happened. Charles showed a stern expression no one had seen before. Why? My girlfriend is... What? Everyone but Charles gasped. What's going on, Charles? What are you to Nancy? No, that's my line, Dad. Why are you taking pictures with Nancy? Because I'm her boyfriend, obviously. No, Nancy is my girlfriend. Isn't your girlfriend your classmate? We just met at a bar and started hanging out. Who would have thought that father and son were dating the same person? This development was also surprising for me. Ignoring Sharon and me, who were in shock, the men started a pointless argument about who was more suitable to be Nancy's boyfriend, which eventually escalated into a full-blown brawl, pulling each other's hair. The brawl ended when Charles pulled out a significant amount of Donald's precious thinning hair. After a glance at the soulless face of Donald, I loudly declared, "'Well, I'm off to my new place. Thank you for everything.' I'll be claiming compensation for the affair next time. Bye. I had said there would be no property division, but I didn't mean compensation. Sharon realized that this was a serious affair and, swinging the bag she was holding, began furiously beating Donald in a rage. Donald stood there, head hung low, as if he had been burnt out completely, unable to process everything happening all at once. Watching this living hell unfold beside me, I couldn't stop smiling as I hopped on my beloved scooter and left the scene. Although it's a far stretch in my mind, I felt like Tom Cruise and Top Gun. Oh, it's been a while since I've ridden down such a refreshing night road. This is the best.
Later on, when I proposed divorce, including the alimony, Charles said, Please, wait on the divorce. It seems that Sharon is also considering divorce, and there is a possibility that everyone might lose their homes or their circumstances might change, so he wants to save as much money as possible. He said things like, Don't you think it's pitiful for us? Who once lived together to face such a difficult situation? And, We need money now, but... I didn't care, so I proceeded with the divorce talks without discussion and took as much money as I could get from Charles and his affair partner. When claiming the alimony, I felt a bit like an outlaw, but I hadn't done anything wrong. I had just done what was natural. Well, maybe tampering with someone's phone was slightly wrong. In the end, around the same time as our divorce, it seemed that Sharon also divorced Donald. Apparently, Donald and Nancy's affair had been going on for over five years, and Sharon couldn't forgive that they had a relationship in private as well. I don't quite understand why bar hopping is forgivable, but private relationships aren't. I thought there are various forms of marriage. Well, in the end, we're not married anymore, anyway. Donald was sued for alimony by Sharon, and Charles was sued for alimony by me. So the saying, blood will out, held true. And the in-laws are now all scattered. Sharon, having been cheated on by Donald, seemed to have grown to despise men in general, including Charles, who had abandoned me in a similar manner. As a result, Charles and Sharon, after the divorce, are slowly becoming distant, though they do have minimal conversations. Donald, jobless, turned to Charles for help but was rejected, as Charles himself was barely scraping by. Charles is juggling multiple jobs, while Sharon, who had been a housewife since her early marriage, is experiencing work for the first time with a part-time job. Donald became a part-time worker living in a cheap hotel. Charles, eager to marry Nancy, learned that she wasn't interested. Nancy saw both Charles and Donald as mere extensions of her bar work, as convenient sources of money. It turned out that Nancy had other men besides Charles in the same capacity. Charles, having been classmates with her, mistook her for being serious and believed she was his destiny. But in reality, it was a foolish and trivial story. In the end, both men were deemed unnecessary by Nancy, even as convenient sources of money, and were discarded. From my perspective, I thought, since I'm leaving, might as well destroy everything in the process, just as I aimed. I'm very satisfied having witnessed the spectacular collapse of a family. No one in that family valued each other, only caring about themselves. So the outcome was, in a way, inevitable. Essentially, they were a family in name only, lacking any compassion. Now I think it was good that I got away from that household. On the other hand, while I still come home exhausted from work every day, living alone has freed up my time as I no longer need to allocate it for someone else. I have more freedom than when I was married. Back when I was married, I hardly had time to meet my college friends, but now I can travel with them on my days off and even have time for my hobbies. In college, I was part of the choir, so I decided to join a karaoke club. It seems that one can continue to improve in music, no matter the age. I consistently win at the club's competitions and even earn cash prizes. Thanks to that, my wallet is always warmly filled. <laughs> at the facility where I work, my colleagues suggested hosting a karaoke recreation event, since I'm good at it, and it was a huge hit. I received many compliments like, You're so good! and was thrilled to bring smiles to the residents through my personal hobby, something I hadn't expected. By the way, my go-to performances are Unchained Melody and My Heart Will Go On. The lyrics of older songs are just so wonderful. I don't really understand recent songs, but I guess I should study up. Though my days aren't glamorous, I'm surrounded by friendly colleagues, trustworthy friends, and kind residents who feel like family beyond work boundaries. Finally, it seems like I've become the Joy Lynn I was meant to be. From now on, I aim to be someone who not only receives joy, but also shares it with others. All right, let's do our best at work today. I'll wholeheartedly celebrate the residents' birthdays.